Welcome to the 2021 Blue Crab Croquet Tournament, a U.S. rules event put on in October of each year by the Chesapeake Bay Croquet Club, which you see here. There are eight lawns on that space, which was built and is owned by Macy White, who's also the tournament director for this tournament. The tournament manager is Steve Thurston, who is president of the local croquet club. This is the final of the Waterford Doubles event. Waterford Doubles just means everybody plays with a different partner in each game in the block play, and then the people with the best cumulative record play in the final. Adam Lasseter playing blue at a handicap of minus one is joined by Sandy Janets on the far left back there playing black. These two are pretty formidable. She was undefeated in block play in first flight, and he won championship flight singles. Their opponents are Marty Carell, about to play at a handicap of eight, and Bo Prilliman, who will play yellow at a handicap of seven. Marty Carell belongs to the local club. Bo Prillman plays at Vero Beach in Florida. I can't tell for sure, but red's not very far past the hoop and may actually be wired from blue. And since blue's the only other ball in the game and black is responsible for red's position, he might get a wiring lift if blue stayed in corner one. And if blue goes to hoop two, he'll definitely get a wiring lift because he's got no backswing. And recognizing all that, Adam puts blue where red has a shot. Macy White's back there showing off the trophies for the tournament. Adams being a little cheeky, giving Red that shot. But there are only two balls out, so it's probably not that dangerous. I'm surprised they didn't take it.
the strategic options in a high-low doubles game can be interesting. One goal is to have your lower handicap player follow their higher handicap player and take advantage of him or her. It's hard for both teams to do that, obviously. And since for red and yellow, the handicaps are seven and eight, there's not much of a difference, so it kind of didn't matter which one of them Adam followed. The other decision Adam and Sandy had to make was who's going to get in and try to go around while the other player tries to keep the opponent out of the game. I'm sure they talked about that. If the lower handicap player goes in first, he's hoping the other team makes a mistake and gives them a two ball break. When you're guarding a hoop, which is what Red is doing here, the corner is not the place to do it. Because now he's completely on the other side of the lawn, whereas if he had done that from the halfway point on either the west or the north boundary, he'd still be in position to shoot at blue. Standard deadness board with the addition of clip position. Adam has appeared in all three of the videos that Brian Hove has sent me from the Blue Crab. And if you've watched the others, you'll know that I am enjoying watching Adam swing. Notice how nothing changes when he makes the hoop. He just lets the ball get in the way of his natural practice swing. A good thing to emulate.
I haven't had the pleasure yet of meeting Marty Carell or Adam Lasseter, but I met Bo Prilliman, who's about to try this jump shot. When he first got started, it was back when Danny Honeycutt had a croquet program going at John's Island, which is near Vero Beach in Florida. Sandy Janets I know quite well because she and her husband Walt live in Indianapolis where I am. We play once a week all summer. And she knows the game very well. I think her husband Walt was the only one who was able to beat Adam in block play. As we've said a couple of times, if you think the opponent's going to go around before you get in, you should put that ball a foot in front of the hoop and off the approach line so they can't knock it out when they make it 2-2 two -two back. Probably not going to happen today. But Adam is certainly capable of doing that. And if you want to see that idea in action, check out the doubles game from this year's U.S. Nationals on this channel between Sandy Canoose and Sharif Abdelwahab versus Stephen Morgan and Matthew Essek. It's a great game for a bunch of reasons.
The spent ball yellow is on the boundary over by hoop three. Looks like Adam's setting up to go get it. Black's other option would have been to go to one back, obviously. This is the safer option in case yellow hits. Yellow is not a great pioneer, but it might be usable up at two bag. Yeah. 
turn red and blue, yellow. Not turn black. That he's leaving the danger ball red down here probably means he's going to settle leave for black when he gets over to three bag. Excellent control of stop shot ratios. So blue makes three hoops, including one back when the opponent has no deadness. Got clean and set a leave for partner in her hoop. Yellows for hoop three. Black's not quite far enough into the hoop to make it automatic, but this is a good setup for yellow. Black's three ball dead, so he doesn't care if black can't see yellow. This deadness board looks like the one designed by Joe Steiner from the Tulsa Croquet Club. It's a two-sided affair, so the spectators can watch it as well. I don't know what that red flag is for. It's been there the whole game. They're using the striped board, so maybe that just tells them that's the board they're using.
Everybody is for this hoop one way or another. A misstep here could be fatal. He made three backs, so if he peels black through four, it's called a back peel. If blue and black had both been for three back, and he put them both through the hoop, either in one or two strokes, that would be a straight peel. If they're both for three back, and he makes three back with blue, then has to come back around to peel black through three back, that's called a posthumous peel. Because unless you have all four balls there to get that done, your break is dead in the water. Looks like he's trying to pick up yellow to send to black.
Yellow, Rocade, Blue. Awesome distance control. Wonder if you'll try the peel. They're down by eight. He's looking at blue, so he understands what's at stake here. But he should have hit yellow about two feet further. One, so that red would have a better chance of putting yellow in a rushable position after hoop four to go to five. And two to avoid the wire, which they called Macy to adjudicate. He needs a ball to put beside red, which blue's dead on, so he can judge whether blue can hit the left side of yellow or not. I'm pretty sure blue can hit the right side of yellow. So, he has a wire, and since yellow is responsible for blue's position, he gets a lift if he wants it. It'll make him three ball dead, but he needs to break up that pair of balls. I just think that music, are you serious? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to give these guys anything. I think that's a that's, that's about the time. <laughs>
He can set up with yellow because he has deadness rotation based on blues being three ball dead. So red can get him out of there before black can come do anything about it. But if he wants to peel yellow, he should put it on this side of the hoop so that when red row K's it, he would knock it into peeling position. This way he's going to knock it out of peeling position when he row K's it. Red and yellow are still down by six, and black has a rush to its soup, so they're going to have to attack. Very nice hoop under control. Trying to make a hoop under control is frequently a recipe for not making a hoop at all. That was lovely. Now what he should do is knock blue down beside black, kick blue out to give yellow a rush on blue to its hoop because yellow is dead on red, and then get black out of there. You should hit first the ball you want to leave behind. Instead, he hits the danger ball first the one he wanted to get rid of. And now he can't do anything with the other two because he's got to get black out of there. The way I was taught to remember this is on a rush to the attack, you hit the spent ball first. On a takeoff to the attack, you hit the danger ball first. I could never remember that. I find it much easier to just think in terms of hitting first the ball I want to leave behind and everything seems to fall in place, at least most of the time. He might have done it this way because he didn't want to get three ball dead. But now he's got nothing.
five minutes left. Brian is so helpful. Adam's swing is exemplary, as I've said. He uses a standard grip with his thumb on top, like Reg Bamford does. The other three players are all using Solomon grips and actually doing pretty well. Jeff Sue and Ben Rothman both use Solomon grips, and they have countless national championships between them. She's asking for a 14-inch rush, but from that distance, he's going to give her three feet, so he has a better chance of giving her a usable angle. Red is live on blue. So is black. In fact, black's live on everybody. They're going to set up to promote yellow after it makes five, but I'm not sure what makes them think they're going to get away with this. Black may be first ball and last turn. And Sharif and Matthew and everybody say that if you're going to practice single ball shots, it should be this one that you practice. She needed to rush blue up by six so that her attack on red and yellow would be easier. Long, accurate rushes are what separate the top players from the rest of us. Black's first last. Black and blue are both now three ball dead, but <clears throat> black's first and last turn, so all they have to do is give those other two balls long shots to a boundary ball, preferably in a corner.
Reds only live on blues, so he'll look to make sure he's not giving it a wiring lift. And they decide the hoop shot's better, which is probably true, because if he makes the hoop, then he has an easier time hitting one of those balls on the boundary, which reinforces why you put blue and black in the corner so that they can get knocked out from two different directions. And it's not meant to be. The handicap system turns out to be prescient. Adam and Sandy won by five. In a handicap game, Marty and Bo would have gotten four bisques, and it would have been a one-pointer, but the same outcome. Sandy Janitz and Adam Lassiter, the champions in the Waterford doubles in the 2021 Blue Crab. This is the last of the three videos I have from this tournament. Thanks again to Brian Hovis for excellent video work. We'll look forward to memorializing many more events from this beautiful site.